Hi, I'm Hugo Parch from Vienna, Austria. And what I would like to try in the next few minutes is to convince you that compression bandages are often more appropriate and more effective than compression stockings. However, it is not so easy to apply a good compression bandage and therefore this should be learned and trained. In this presentation we will cover basic physical principles, types of compression bandages, indications for the use of these compression bandages, and some principles on how the compression bandages are to be applied. The most important indications for compression bandages include venous edema and lymphedema after varicose vein surgery or sclerotherapy, skin changes on the lower leg caused by venous insufficiency such as eczema, lipodermatosclerosis, active or healed ulceration, superficial phlebitis, and deep venous thrombosis. Several devices may be chosen for compression therapy of the swollen limb. These include compression bandages, intermittent pneumatic compression pumps, or therapeutic compression stockings of various strengths. Frequently, compression will be used following varicose vein surgery or sclerotherapy. Active exercises, especially walking, enhance the effects achieved with compression. The aim of compression therapy is to reduce edema, to accelerate venous blood flow, and to reduce venous reflux, thereby improving venous pumping action. Edema can readily be checked by measuring the leg circumference or using an infrared instrument as seen here. There are many other beneficial effects of compression such as improving lymphatic drainage, enhancing the microcirculation, maintaining the integrity of the endothelium, and influencing cytokine release. This may explain the anti-inflammatory and analgesic effects of compression. Bandages certainly are not old-fashioned and in some cases are much more effective than compression stockings to heal an open ulcer or to reduce massive edema. In general, it is more difficult to apply a bandage than to put on a stocking. Therefore, the application of compression bandages need to be done by trained personnel. The pressure and material must be tailored to the underlying condition of the leg. To begin with, the amount of compression pressure depends mainly on the tension of the bandage, as well as the radius of the leg and on the numbers of layers of bandage which are used. The local pressure is defined as the quotient between the force which is exerted and the area on which the tension or force is working. The law of Laplace has very important practical implications on compression therapy. The pressure is indirectly proportional to the virtual radius of the limb segment, which means that it depends very much on the curvature of the limb. The pressure will be lower over flat areas and higher over curved areas such as the shin or the Achilles tendon. If we want to compress a superficial vein like the great saphenous vein by external compression, one will need to apply a pressure pad or roll over that vein which will decrease the radius and thus increase the pressure on that segment of the leg. As a practical consequence of Laplace's law, the local pressure may be affected by using different kinds of overlay materials. For flat parts of the leg where high pressure is desirable, small and hard rolls and pads will increase the pressure. Sharply curved parts of the leg, such as tendons and the shin, where pressure sores may develop, can be protected with large and soft overlays like cotton wool, which will decrease the local pressure. When a pad made of rubber foam is placed behind the inner ankle, the curved part should be directed toward the skin. The same applies to skin changes where we want to have a high local pressure, such as venous ulcers, lipodermatosclerosis, phlebitis, or after sclerotherapy. 
Using a medical compression stocking, the local pressure behind the inner ankle is only around 10 millimeters, which is inadequate. By applying rubber foam pads, this pressure can be doubled. A lower level of compression is necessary over sharp edges of the leg, including over the dorsal tendon area. This part may be flattened by a layer of cotton wool in order to protect the skin from too high a pressure. Compression pressure also depends on the number of applied layers. With each additional layer, pressure increases to produce a firm bandage which exerts more than 40 millimeters on the distal lower leg. The elastic properties of the compression material are determining factors. Elasticity is defined by the ability of the material to counteract a stretching force. Extensibility, on the other hand, means the change of length of a bandage when subjected to an extending force. In the case of a short stretch or inelastic bandage, the extensibility is less than 70%, while the long stretch or elastic bandage can be stretched for more than 140% of its original length. A circade device or a zinc plaster gauze, the so-called Una's boot, are examples of completely inelastic materials with a stretch of zero. Examples of short stretch bandages with an extensibility lower than 70% are Rosadol or Comperlund bandages. Inelastic, the so-called short stretch bandages, exert high pressure waves during walking. Therefore, their working pressure is high. Medium stretch and long stretch materials are used for medical compression stockings. These stockings give way to expansion of the muscles during walking, resulting in a much lower working pressure. The relationship between the stretch of a bandage and the exerted pressure is characterized by a hysteresis curve. The x-axis represents the stretching force, and the y-axis is the pressure which is obtained. Elastic material needs much more stretch for achieving a certain pressure than inelastic material. When one elastic bandage is wrapped over another, the resulting bandage becomes more inelastic. When the patient walks, the pressure on the leg is greater with the inelastic short stretch bandage compared to an elastic bandage. The pressure on the leg with an inelastic bandage is less than the elastic bandage at bed rest. This results in less discomfort for the patient. The higher resting pressure exerted by the elastic bandage results in greater patient discomfort during inactivity. Here is an example of the dramatic improvement of leg swelling with a reduction of the calf circumference of five centimeters in just five days using a multi-layer short stretch bandage. What has been achieved in this patient can be demonstrated by duplex examination, which shows clefts filled with water in the skin before therapy. Five days after compression, the water has disappeared and the level of the cutaneous layers reduced to 50%. Duplex scanning is an important tool in the evaluation of deep vein thrombosis, venous insufficiency, and edema of the leg. Elastic compression stockings are the method of choice to prevent leg edema, pain, and ulceration on a long-term basis. Compression bandages should be used with caution in patients with arterial disease. A bandage should never cause pain when sitting or lying down, and if this should occur, the bandage should be immediately removed. In a patient with a swollen leg and arterial occlusive disease, edema impedes arterial flow and interferes with nutrition of the tissues. Edema reduction will improve nutrition. With an ankle brachial index between 0.5 and 0.8, bandages must be applied with extremely low resting pressure to parallel the reduced systolic ankle pressure. Active or passive ankle movement should also be used in these patients. These bandages should be changed frequently in order to evaluate the leg for skin damage. In the case of absent pulses and an ankle brachial index less than 0.5, intermittent pneumatic compression is useful to increase the arterial flow. In patients with decreased skin sensation, such as from diabetic neuropathy, extreme caution with any kind of pressure bandage is mandatory. The patient seen here may walk on these stones all day. Some basic principles on how to apply a bandage correctly include maximum extension of the ankle and protecting the tendons and the shin using cotton layers. 
the operator should press the bandage roll to the lower leg and then guide it up to the head of the fibula. The operator should always avoid folds and model the bandage around dips in the edematous skin. Remember, several layers increase the pressure and facilitate uniform compression. For the thigh, we prefer adhesive short stretch bandages which do not slip down and may stay on the leg for as much as one to two weeks. The operator should start the bandage on the proximal lower leg, protecting the tendons behind the knee with cotton wool. This should result in a pressure at the mid-thigh level of about 40 millimeters of mercury. Here's an example of a thigh bandage using adhesive short stretch material such as Panelast, which is applied immediately after varicose vein surgery. Flush ligation and stripping of the great saphenous vein is usually done in these cases. Pressure on the mid-thigh is about 40 millimeters of mercury. The patient is encouraged to walk immediately and the bandage stays for seven to 10 days. Patients with post-thrombotic syndrome and acute ulceration are often initially treated best with an UNAS boot. First, Dr. Hugo Parsh applies a non-stick medicated gauze over the ulcer. Soft webral material is next applied to protect the anterior tibial area and heal. A foam pad is incorporated into the dressing to increase the local pressure over the ulcer. The UNAS boot, when it dries, will provide a completely rigid and inelastic bandage which will result in zero pressure on the leg at rest. An overwrap using a short stretch bandage completes the dressing. Changing this bandage should be done every three to five days in the beginning and every seven to ten days as the ulcer drains less and begins to heal. Before you do a firm compression stocking, you always should be sure that you feel the pulses. If this is not the case, uh, you always should go on uh, to have a Doppler investigation. First of all, we protect the tendons here in order to prevent any kind of skin damage when we do our short stretch inelastic stiff material. The first layer of this short stretch bandage we start between the tendon and the heel. And what you can see here is that I have one hand free already and I can go on above and then down, do a second one and then I go up. And what you can see is I try to stay with the roll always on the leg. So don't do it like this, but try to mold, to model this bandage to the leg. Here in this region on the distal lower leg, you should have considerable pressure. From the half of the calf, you can reduce your pressure. When the bandage is finished, you fix it with tape. For the second layer, of a bandage, you can do exactly the same if you are right-handed. The putter technique would go the other way around. And as you can see, I take a broader bandage here for the second layer. And my intention will be to mold out these wrinkles which I have produced by my first bandage. Again, the foot should be dorsiflexed and I try to mold the bandage to the leg and to mold out the small uh, wrinkles which you can see here with considerable pressure. From the middle of the calf you can reduce your pressure, try to keep it even, and you go up to the head of the fibula, and you can go down again, and you fix it. In summary, compression is a very effective treatment which has been used for many centuries. We hope that this video helps you better understand 
this ancient but very effective treatment modality of compression therapy. Here we see an historic example. As an act of self-punishment, Saint Peregrinus, a medieval monk, did not lie down. As a result, he developed varicose veins and ultimately an ulcer. Amputation was planned. Then a miracle happened and the ulcer was healed. Nobody knew what really happened. The sculptor of this beautiful altar in Carinthia, Austria, saw what happened. An angel applied a good compression bandage. 